All right, guys um, and gals. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, custom modules uh, and runners. Uh, mostly custom modules. We'll hit the runner modules a bit and may even mention state modules, depending on how much time we have. Um, my name is Colton Myers. I'm a platform engineer at SaltStack. Um, been there for a couple of years, so I, I recognize some of you from last year's SaltConf, but we have a lot of new people, which has been fun. Um, how many of you have written a custom module for Salt? All right, pretty good, pretty good amount of people. Um, all right, that's, that's a good starting point. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what custom modules are, how awesome they are, um, how runners, what runners are and how they work. Um, we are going to code dive a little bit into an existing module um, or two just to kind of see what tools we have available and see uh, how these existing modules are written. Um, and I think you'll come to see that custom modules are really easy. Um, when we think of writing custom code for an existing platform like SaltStack, usually what comes to mind, at least for me, is a lot of boilerplate code, a lot of gotchas, a lot of things that we need to know, a steep learning curve maybe. Um, and in Salt, I, I'm, I think it's pretty safe to say that none of that is true. Um, all you have to know is how to write some Python, and even if you don't know Python, it's about the easiest language to learn out there. So um, it's pretty cool. So, and we are going to do, uh, we're going to talk about the tools that are available, and I am going to live code a uh, custom module as well, so. Come on, there we go. So, execution modules. Execution modules are run on the minion. Um, when you do a salt star test.ping, you're running the, ex the test execution module with the ping function inside of that module. Um, it's just simple Python. There's actually no boilerplate that you need to add. Um, we do uh, load, the, the salt loader actually provides some magic variables that we're going to talk about that really make your life easy and uh, give you the full power of salt um, in a really easy and simple way. Uh, and Salt also makes it really easy to manage these modules from your master. You don't have to manually copy these to each minion and put them in the correct folder and make sure they're up to date and so forth. Um, you just stick them in a specific folder on your master. The master syncs them down to the minions. And <laughs> you, somebody is trolling me on Twitter. I, I should have turned my watch off. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so when you sync these to your, to your minions from your master, uh, it, it will sync removals, it'll sync modifications. Um, all of this is handled very transparently, um, and so it's really easy to uh, deploy this code. So runners, on the other hand, are executed on the master. Um, because they're executed on the master, there's a little bit less, we provide fewer magic variables because most of these magic variables are um, minion related, and since you're executing on the master, you need to be able to orchestrate minions and so forth. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But basically, any time that you need to run a command from just a single central location, or if you need to orchestrate your minions, OK, these guys need to run something, and then this needs to happen. I need to process that data and stick it somewhere else. Um, any of those kinds of situations are where you might use uh, a custom runner. So let's look at uh, some existing execution modules. Ugh. All right, so I am just in my local salt clone. Oh, that is, let's bring that up just a tad. All right, can everybody, can everybody see that? How's the size? Keep me posted. Raise your hand if you can't see it. All right, so, um, and let's see here. All right, so we are um, a few commits after 2015.2.0 uh, RC1, um, which is a, a good enough starting point. So we'll stick there. So inside of the Salt repo, um, all of the existing modules ship inside of Salt slash modules. So let's let's check out test.py. Um, this is some uh, module that pretty much everybody who has ever used Salt has run because it's one of the first ones that we have you run. Um, and it has some of the most simple modules in it. So if we look for ping, for example, that is a terrible highlight color. Um, 
we can see this is a pretty simple function. It actually used to be a single line um, until CR decided to muck it up with all of this proxy minion stuff. Not, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but you can ignore all this stuff. Um, basically, we just return true. Um, sleep is actually a better example these days because it stayed simple. Um, all we do is time.sleep in length, and then we return true. Um, and so you can see that, you know, interestingly enough, you know, it looks like we have a fair amount of boilerplate because we have all these things that we're importing at the top and this proxy enabled stuff. None of that is actually required. If I were to just stick uh, this, you know, the, the you know, def sleep length and then these two lines into a Python file and sync it down to my minions, it would just work. Um, I guess we'd have to import time. Uh, but it's pretty simple stuff. So let's, let's look at a little bit more of a, an advanced example or, or a more complex example, I guess. Um, let's look at the file module. So um, the file module is one that most people have used. More people use the file state, I think, uh, but the, the module provides a lot of functionality as well. Let's look at the append uh, method here, function. All right, so append allows us to append text to a file. We take an arbitrary number of arguments and just append each of those arguments to the file uh, with a new line in between. So let's look at this code. So we use os.path to you know, expand tildes and that kind of stuff inside of our, um, the path that we passed in. Um, and then we basically, uh, we, we do a little bit of massaging of the args, uh, but mostly we just open the file, um, we make sure there's a new line at the end of the file. Uh, the most common use case, you don't really, if, if for some reason there's not a new line at the end of the file, you don't want to start appending mid-line. Uh, so maybe that's not a, as general of a use case as, as it could be. Um, but we make sure there's a new line at the end of the file, and then for line and args, OS, o, we, uh, we just write to our file with a new line for each of those arguments. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. This is just Python. Um, we do uh, use a you know we use salt.utils.fopen, which uh, sets a flag that I can't remember the name of for the for the file to make sure that it gets closed and we don't uh, leak file descriptors. Uh, but for the most part, this is just Python code. Um, and so it's pretty straightforward that way. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. So let's look at an example that uses, that utilizes some of the uh, magic variables that I've been mentioning, and then, we'll, and then we'll talk in a little bit more detail about those. Um, the config module has a function called git, and what git does, what config.git does is allows you to search a variety of locations inside of salt for a given configuration value. Um, so, for example, we use this when Sometimes we allow you to, to configure things in the minion config or in the minion pillar or in the minion grains or in the master config. And this is how we handle all of that. Um, so it will actually search the local minion config and then the minion's grains and then the minion's pillar and then the master config in that order for a given value. So what does this look like? Again, we're using these salt utils. We, we have a lot of helper functions in there, but basically we're just going to traverse um, a dictionary and or a list. And so we see these magic variables. Um, for those who may not be, have written much Python, or even some of the Python people aren't aware of this, um, when I use the word dunder, um, I'm talking about variables with double underscores before and after. So when I say dunder ops, that's what I mean. Um, and it's just kind of a, I don't know, I, <laughs> it's stuck in my brain, so I'll say it. So, fair warning. Um, so basically we search Dunder Ops, which turns out to be the minion options, uh, both in the minion config as well as all the defaults that we have defined. Um, and then we search Dunder Grains, which is just our, our, the dictionary of all of our grains. Dunder Pillar, same thing, but for pillar. And then it turns out the way we get the master config on the minion is that by default, we actually ship the master config inside of pillar. So that's what that line is. And then when we find it, we return it. And that's it. I mean, I, we return it as we find it, but. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these magic variables, maybe. All right, so we have our dunder variables. So uh, we talked about ops, pillar, and grains. Those are all pretty straightforward. Um, it's just the data from those, those various uh, data structures. 
Uh, Dunder Salt is actually, in my opinion, the coolest one. Um, inside of Dunder Salt, it's a dictionary in which we put all of the execution module functions in salt. So inside of that dictionary is a reference to command.run, config.get, test.ping, all of the loaded execution module functions are in that dictionary. Um, that's, that's a little bit weird if you're a, pr a programmer that comes from a background like Java or so forth where, where you can't just pass around functions as objects. Um, but w so we just load all of those function objects into this dictionary and then we can call them. So here we are, uh, you know, if you look at the example in the middle of that box, we have Dundersalt and then we reference into the dictionary for command.run and that returns the function object and so then we can immediately run the function with, you know, just with using, using parentheses just like any other function. Um, and we'll see more examples of that. Um, Dunder virtual um, is another special uh, uh, function. It's actually a function, not, a, not, a, not just a normal variable, but um, this one isn't provided to you by salt, it's, it's utilized by salt instead. It allows us to interact with and give information to the salt loader. So um, it allows us to only load a, an execution module on a platform where it can actually run. You know, so if we, if we write a Debian specific execution module, we don't want to load that and then throw stack traces and everything on a Red Hat system. Um, and so that's where we control that kind of thing. Uh, we can also, in that function, specify an alternate name by which uh, we will uh, load the, the execution module. So the most common example of this in salt is the pkg modules. Um, when you say pkg.install, um, you don't have to worry about what, what kind of platform you're targeting except for, you know, the, the names, you know, Apache is HTTPD on RHEL and it's Apache 2 on Debian systems. Um, but you don't need to worry about the fact that you're using yum versus apt-get. That just is handled for you. And so let's look a little bit what this looks like. So app, pa app pkg, app package, <coughs> is the pkg module for Debian systems. Okay, so if we look here, we're not going to look at the code very much because it's, it's quite complex. But if you see, we, okay, we try to import these various libraries, um, and then if we, you know, have an import error, we, uh, we set this variable to false. And then down here, when we get to the Dunder virtual function, we can see, oh, actually, we don't actually use those in this one. Okay. Anyway, so if we look at this Dunder virtual function, we can see, okay, we're going to use this Dunder grains, and we're going to see, okay, if, is, the, is this Debian or not? If it's not Debian, we return false. If it is Debian, we return Dunder virtual name, which is just a variable that says pkg. Okay? So if you return true from a virtual function, it's going to just load that, that uh, module under its given name. Uh, if you return a string, then it'll, return, then it'll load it under that name, and if you return false, it won't load it at all. Okay? So, um, if you're on a Debian system, it's going to load this under pkg, so you can do pkg.install. What if you're on a Red Hat system? Well, we go over here to the yum package.py and look at its virtual function, and we see similar, it's a little bit more complex, but uh, we can ignore this yum provider thing that's uh, separate and actually deprecated. Um, but we get the OS grain and the OS family grain. We have a couple of um, exceptions that don't necessarily report those grains properly. But if OS family is, is Red Hat or OS grain is in the, this list, then we're going to load this module. Um, otherwise, we don't. And so that means that, okay, Red Hat machines are going to load this one, Debian machines are going to load the last one we saw, and they, we can just have this abstraction layer um, that's invisible to the, to the user, which is pretty cool. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? It's kind of an interesting system. Um, what version we're we using? It's very new. 
I think it's 2015.2 is where that was introduced. So nowadays, you can actually return, in addition to faults, you can return the reason that it wasn't loaded. And then Salt can utilize that later when, you know, uh, if you've been using Salt for a while, you've probably run into an instance where you try to use a module that says, uh, function blah, blah, blah is not available. And it's kind of doesn't really tell you why it's not available. And, and you come to learn that it's probably a dependency issue. You're probably missing the dependency for that module. Um, but now we've, we've implemented a system whereby we can say exactly what the problem is. You know, did it stack trace when it was trying to load it, or did it just, you know, did it just not find the dependencies and that kind of stuff? But I'm pretty sure that's 2015.2. Uh, so. Oh, and if more than one module returned the same, uh, the same virtual name, then the last one that's loaded is the one that wins. So that's the way that works. Any other questions about Dunder Virtual? Any questions about, you know, Dunder Salt or Dunder Ops or any of these other ones? All right. Syncing modules. Once you've written your module, simple Python script, simple Python, Python module, you can just stick it inside of your file server. Um, by default, you know, you have your base environment in slash SRV slash salt. Inside of that base environment, you create an underscore modules directory. Any Python file you stick, it, stick in there is going to be synced down to your minions. Any Python file that you later remove will be removed from the minions. It, it syncs that whole directory, including deletions. Um, you can sync, do, you can perform the actual sync. It will automatically sync before any state run. Um, but you can also do it manually with sync modules or sync all in the salt util module. Um, yeah. Any questions about that? We're gonna we're gonna show that in action in just a moment. The loader does not handle nested directories at all. It needs to be flat. Um, we've and that's just to keep the namespace very simple. Um, we've had some people who want to, you know, add tiered namespace to the to the module system, and we're we're considering it, but currently it's not supported. So that's expected, for better or worse. Any other questions? Um, the question was, will modules which can never be loaded by a given minion be synced to that minion? And the answer is yes. That's why you have to use the Dunder virtual function so that the, mod, mo the minion will try to load the, load the module and be unsuccessful. There's no way for the master to really know whether that minion's going to be able to load the module. It, it could try to inspect based on grains and so forth, but until you actually load it, you don't know if the dependencies are going to be there or whatever. So yes, they, they get synced to all minions. Any other questions? All right. So let's let's code one of these up. That can be pretty useful. Let's jump out of this, jump onto a server here, Ugh. and make sure I don't tip my table here. I'm gonna go to Bash because it doesn't have all my colors. I I, these projectors aren't very good with dark color schemes, so I'm using a light color scheme, and none of my configuration plays well with that, so we'll, we'll hope this works. All right, um, so we're gonna go to SRV slash salt, and I think I already have a, yep, we're gonna just remove that and make it again. This is the same one I used yesterday, so. Man, that's why I don't live code. All right, so. We have, okay, I guess I should talk about the, the use case that I'm gonna use. So um, custom modules, the, the, the mistake that many people who are new to Salt make is they think that custom modules are uh, only for big use cases. That, you know, little things, I don't know, it, it's, it's this, it, I think it comes from the idea that we think that it's gonna be harder than it actually is. Um, Any time that you feel like you need to alter return data or combine different calls or any, anything, anytime you try to do anything programmatic in a state run, you should turn to custom modules. A lot of people turn to Jinja and they try to start, you know, coding Jinja macros and, you know, having these huge, huge unreadable Jinja blocks that are really hard to maintain. 
when you could just really quickly code up a custom module and keep it in Python and keep it simple. Um, Jinja is great for limited templating, but in my opinion, it doesn't handle, it's not a programming language. Um, you can make it do crazy things, but I don't recommend it. Um, so the use case we're gonna say, say right now is, is pretty contrived, uh, but it still is uh, a good example. Say you, we have, let's see here, we have right here, users dot, or user, that was a typo we had in our training manual yesterday, which is kind of funny. User dot list users. I hope my minions are actually there. Otherwise, this is gonna be embarrassing. All right. So we have our list of users. And if we do this with, uh, come on, dash dash out JSON, we can see that it is an actual list, okay? That's, what, that's how it is stored in, in memory, okay? Let's say we need to utilize this list of users, but for the service or application for which we need to use it, we need it at, in a comma-separated value, CSV, okay? You could, I'm sure you could transform this in Jinja. There's probably a, a join uh, that's pretty easily accessible, but we're gonna write a custom module for this. So we're gonna say custom users.py, okay? And just to show you how, e how simple this is, we're gonna keep this, oh, we actually need to call it something though. Uh, users as CSV. Um, and we're gonna just say, okay, we have our user list, and we're gonna use that dunder salt variable from before, user.list users, and we're gonna call that, that doesn't take any arguments. And so now we have our user list, and then our CSV is going to be comma.join user list, and then we're going to just return that. And yes, I could do this all in one line, but meh. Okay, four lines of Python, no imports, no boilerplate, nothing. Just four lines of Python. And we'll see if I made any stupid typos. Okay, so salt star salt util dot sync all. I know there's another minion because it responded earlier. There we go. So I'm using sync all and this is instructive also because you can see all of the other things that you can write custom code for and sync them down. Uh, but we, we can see that our, our module was synced down. So that means it is immediately available for our use. Uh, custom users dot users as CSV. Ta-da! If we do out JSON, we can see that it is just a string with a list of all of our users, okay? No use case is too small for custom, for, for custom modules, in my opinion. That's the place you should turn first because it's just so easy. Whether you need to write a complex integration with some uh, internal tool that, that your company is as uh, homebrewed or whatever, or uh, you just need to massage return data. Uh, custom modules are the way to go. Any questions about this? Yes, you can, you can create an underscore modules directory inside of your GitFS and that will sync as well. Yep. Other questions? Wow, you guys are low maintenance. All right. Say what? Sure. Uh, how's that? Do you want to open it in Vim? So, um, this modules that are synced this way are first class modules in Salt. They're not, you know, they act just like other modules. Now, now that I've synced this, it, this is available to other custom modules. If I were to write another custom module that called out to this one and did work that way, it would work just fine. Um, in fact, if we, let's create some documentation here. This, oops, this is my awesome doc string. Okay. Sync that down again. Uh, 
Okay, so that's our, that's our module that we just synced down. So now, and this is cool if you've never seen this, um, SALT is very self-documenting. Um, and so if you're not familiar with the, oops, sys module, um, it's super useful. Uh, sys gives us a, a number of different things. We can list functions and pass in a, uh, an execution module like custom users, our, our fresh one here. And we see that inside of that module we have a single uh, function. And then we can use sys.doc and pass in that function, uh, dot users as CSV, and we can see the documentation. Um, so it acts just like, and you can do this with normal salt modules, obviously, it's super useful. So if I wanna say list functions, <coughs> spell that correctly, oh, man. Uh, PKG. All right, we can see all the PKG stuff. And I think this list is probably different since this is a Debian and a Cent minion, but I'm, I'm bad at diffing with my plain eyes. But um, anyways, if we were to say, okay, sys.doc pkg.install, we get all of the documentation for, for package.install. Um, you can actually just pass in, if you want, you can just pass in the module and it will give you all the documentation for the whole module. It's pretty verbose, so uh, it's l not super useful, but it can be, especially if you pipe into less. So that's really cool. Um, so it, the modules that you sync down are accessible that way. They're accessible uh, from states. So if you write a custom state, you can call out to your custom modules. Um, yeah, any questions so far? All right. Oh, yep. Um, for the the documentation. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, it's inside of custom users, so that's custom users dot users users as CSV. Um, we could, if we wanted to, we could load it as something else. That is def under virtual. Okay. So let's say, okay, uh, if under grains uh, OS family oops, uh, equals red hat, then we're going to return true. No, actually, we're going to return false. Okay, so we're only gonna load it on our Debian minions, or I guess non-Red Hat minions anyway. Uh, otherwise, we're going to return awesome. Okay, let's sync that. Tilde.sync modules. You can do it. I don't know why it's taking so long. That's the local minion. All right, there it is. Uh, so now it's called, what do I call it? Awesome. Awesome.users as CSV. Oh. I don't think so. Uh, return false, return awesome. Yeah, let's try it. Maybe it's, I, I, usually I do, but I didn't think it actually needed it. Name equals awesome with the quotes. And then we'll return that. All right. Don't make a liar out of me, salt. There it is. I guess it does. So, um, as you can see, it was not loaded on our CentOS minion. It was loaded on our Debian minion, um, and it's loaded under the name Awesome. So apparently you do have to use your Dunder virtual name. Um, all right, any other questions about custom execution modules? Uh, 
um, as in if a function fails. So there's no really well-defined uh, uh, process for that. You can, you can throw an exception if you want. Um, you can just return false or return an error message. Um, it's useful to just document you know, what, what that looks like in your doc string, uh, but we don't have a clear uh, best practice there uh, like we do with states. It's something some uh, community members have been, have been pushing for, and uh, we probably will at some point, but right now they're pretty free form. I saw a couple others. So you want to know how to test a module before syncing it. Um, the problem is that, I mean, if it's just pure Python without using any of those uh, Dunder variables, then you could just run it, no problem. Um, otherwise, you're, you're probably going to need to run it under a minion context. Um, I would probably do it if you just sync it to your local minion. You know, most, most of the time you have a minion uh, hooked up to the master. That, that's, that's a pretty easy way. Um, I think there's a way to, in a, in a Python prompt, I think, I think you can uh, trigger the loader manually, but I don't know off the top of my head um, how, that, how, how to do that. So um, uh, talk to me later and maybe we'll, we'll figure something out. But, but for the most part, you just sync it because it's so fast, it's just not a big deal. But any other questions? All right, let's talk a little bit about runners. Uh, let's go, okay. So we're still in the, we're back in the salt repo. Um, we're just gonna, I'm not gonna write a custom runner, uh, but I'm just gonna kind of show you what's available. Um, so a good example of a runner is the manage runner. So we have manage.up, which will get a list of all of our minions which are responding to test.pings, okay? And it actually just calls status, which is also in here, okay? So, um, for runners, we don't have the Dunder Salt uh, dictionary because that doesn't really make sense. We are running, this is, this is running on the master, so if we want to call out to an execution module which is designed to run on the minion, then we need to call out to the minion. And so uh, you actually use the, uh, the local client, the Python API, um, to do this. And you can just, we do provide Dunder ops, which are the master ops. So um, salt.client.getLocalClient expects the location of the con configuration file, um, and so we give it that. And then when we send out a command, we, in this case, we forward the timeout. You could define your own timeout for this command if you wanted, but we're just running uh, test.ping on star, uh, just like normal. Um, the, the Python client API is super easy to use. Um, so uh, if you just search on the docs for uh, Python API, you should be good. Um, we can actually access salt, salt key um, and it's, it's various things. Um, so we actually get a list of all of our keys and then we compare that list to the minions that actually responded and that gives us our minions that are up and our minions that are down. So that's how that works. Um, any questions on that? Uh, how are we doing? Okay, nine minutes. Um, the runner that probably most people use most often, or, or not status, state. So um, the state.orchestrate runner is, is really the, one of the most, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, useful or powerful instances of a runner, um, in my opinion. Uh, this allows us to, normally with a state run, you say, okay, all of my minions, or however many minions I wanna run this on, run this state file, or run your high state. And all those minions do it at the same time without any knowledge of other minions or their executions or anything else. They just do their thing, return it, and they're done. However, that doesn't always uh, fit what, what, we, what we need Salt to do. Sometimes we need to spin up these servers over here, get the database initialized before we ever initialize our app or deploy our code over here that's actually gonna utilize that. Um, and so to do that, we use the orchestrate runner. Um, there's there's a, a substantial documentation page on this, but basically um, 
the orchestrate runner uses the state system on the master to orchestrate these, these you know, different calls across our minions. You can call out to you know, execution modules or state runs or whatever. Um, and you can use requisites so you can say, OK, I'm only going to run this, these states if uh, these other states ran successfully um, on these other minions. Um, it has the full power of the state system behind it. Um, and it's, it could be a whole, tra a whole track of talks, I think, um, on Orchestrate. So I'm not going to go into it, but uh, that's, that's the, uh, in my opinion, one of the more powerful uses of the runner system. Um, runners are not quite so easy to, uh, you can't just stick them in your file, ser file server yet. Um, there's actually an open uh, feature request to create an underscore runners directory that won't be synced to the minions, but will be made available to master. Um, Right now, you either have to stick it inside of the salt install or define the extension modules directory for uh, runners. Um, and then, the, and that's in the master config, and that will allow you access to them. Um, I saw a question. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we want to make those easier. Uh, honestly, uh, the, I, don't, I know very few people who have had a really good use case for writing a custom runner. Custom execution modules. Uh, they're, they're, they abound, the use cases, but uh, runners are a little bit less common. Uh, so, <coughs> Any questions about custom runners or runners in general? Okay, um, and then since we have just a couple minutes, uh, let's talk briefly about states. Um, as you, if you noticed, when I was doing a sync all, it was syncing states as well, and so you can just create an underscore states directory and stick files in there. Um, question over here? Oh, sorry, <laughs> you're just stretching, that's fine. I just want to make sure. Uh, okay, so the, the difference with states, the main difference is that uh, we have a very well-defined uh, return structure for the states. They need to return a dictionary and it needs to have these keys in it. And you can see that uh, if we just go to the docs, I'll just show you. I know this is too small, I'll make it bigger, I promise. Custom states. State modules, that's the one. All right, so state modules. Where is, here we are. So this is our return data. This is just, this is the one thing I wanted to show you. Um, all states will have a name, which is uh, almost always the same name that was passed in as the first, oh, that's the other thing. Two things with custom state modules, this return structure, and then the first argument in every state module function needs to be name. Um, it doesn't always fit super well, but uh, that's, that's the, the uh, variable name that was chosen, and we're stuck with it at this point because we have tons and tons of code that relies on that. Um, so the first argument should always be name, um, and that's also passed back in the return structure. Um, you can return a dictionary with changes, um, which usually will have like the file diff in a file.manage state or whatever. Um, the result, which is either true or false, um, it can be none also if um, a state is run with test equals true, um, uh, so that y if, if changes would have been made, then, th then you can return none for the result. And then a comment saying, you know, what was changed or what was not changed or, or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing with states, um, is that they need to adhere to this um, return structure. Um, and they need to have name as their first argument. But otherwise, they're basically the same. And um, usually, you should write your state such that they, they don't implement behavior that could be uh, stuck in an execution module. You know, you stick all the, all the actual work in execution modules and then just have the state kind of orchestrate, <laughs> orchestrate those different functions um, for, to do the actual work. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't think it would cause any problems as far as I know. Um, we actually have, I think we, I think we might do that for some of our uh, UI stuff that, that we've been working on, so. Any other questions? All right. Let's see if I had any other slides. I think we were just about there, but. 
Oh, runner changes. Just um, for those who may have been around for a while, you used to have to do your own outputting. Um, it, it wasn't piped through the output system or anything like that. These days, output is handled for you. You just return the data, and it, and it is outputted, and you can use dash dash out to define a, an outputter. Um, you can still output if you want. It'll just then output twice. So um, it's, it's completely backwards compatible, um, but that's, that's that. Um, there's also a cool new uh, thing where you can do progress events with a runner. Um, might as well show you that really quick. We have the uh, test runner. And if we go down to stream, this is very new. I'm pretty sure it's not actually in a released version of Sol, so I don't know why I'm showing it to you. But um, uh, we have this JIT event dot fire event thing where we can actually fire events that will be shown. Um, so when 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 the runner is actually run with Salt Run, that's a lot of runs. Um, you and you fire these events, they'll actually show up for the for the user that ran the runner. Wow, this is overloaded. Um, and you can say, okay, you know, this is this is how far we are through this. So eventually, we want to add this to state.orchestrate and so forth, so you can see, you know, where we are in the state run and so forth. Um, so that's just something cool to know about um, if you're writing your own runners. Uh, yeah, and it's all backwards compatible. So, any other questions? Uh, the question was, I, I, I missed some of it, but I think the question overall was, uh, is there any uh, best practice in the values that you return from an execution module? Um, the, the biggest key is that it must be mass message pack serializable. So it needs to be uh, basic types in Python, dictionaries, strings, lists, uh, uh, integers, booleans, that kind of stuff. Um, otherwise, you can return you know, anything within those parameters, um, and it will... Yeah, it worked just fine with salt. Does that answer your question? It's not it like, and you're saying it should be, but it's not. Um, so certain custom modules. Uh, Define or certain modules uh, define their own uh, outputters. So, for example, there is a grains outputter. So that's why grains data looks a little bit different when you output that. Um, there's a high state outputter, um, and so that that's probably what's happening is that it's it's just choosing a different default outputter based on the data that it's receiving. Um, and if you just say dash dash out and force it to JSON or nested, which is the default for most commands, then it should all look the same. Any other questions? Um, no, modules are not stateful. They, they, it's, it, since since we, in states, we're trying to enforce the state of, a, of our server, right? And so there's designed to be uh, what's called idempotent or idempotent, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, so that it will check for the state, only change things if it needs to be changed, and then uh, report you know, the changes that it made. Uh, with a module, uh, we just do a task. You know, it's the difference between package.installed, which is the, the state, and package.install, which is the module. So when we call package.install, we're just going to try to install it. It's just going to say app get install this package. It's not going to you know, try to check if it's already installed or, or you know, that kind of thing, whereas package.install does all that extra work. So uh, making a test mode for uh, custom, ex custom execution modules is not really it doesn't really fit into that paradigm quite so well. And to answer your original question, no, we don't have any test equals true for custom modules. Any other questions? So another state to, to look at the results of another state module. Um, 
there, there's two ways to do this. One is you can use a requisite like on changes. So another state can do something only if there are changes in this other state. If you want to actually inspect that actual data, um, then you, you actually can. It's a little bit out of the scope of this. There, there, there actually are some, uh, some of those Dunder variables made available to you. Um, the one in this case would be Dunder running, which is the underlying running dictionary for the state system and contains all of the previously run states for the state run. And you can actually inspect that. Um, uh, yeah, Dunder running, what's the other one? There's another one available, Dunder context, which is used for certain things. Uh, th that stuff gets fairly complex fairly quickly, so I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, feel free to ask me more afterwards. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>